So this morning, um, I am going to split up the, the, the talks or, or the presentation in two section. Uh, so of, of course, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna probably over the next couple of slides, uh, go over some of the key sort of take home messages and, and sort of like perspectives that we had obtained uh, to date after, you know, four, four years or so managing the genotyping projects and share some of the challenges uh, on, you know, faced by many breeding programs um, in, in adopting and implementing a sustainable genomic selection strategy. And uh, I'll touch on some of the more high level messaging and then uh, just three to four slides and I'll pass it on to, to Raja Guru Bohar. He, he's a regional genotyping coordinator in, in South Asia. I think he's right now home base uh, in Tamil Nadu, but uh, um, in the regular times, he'll be based out of uh, Simit office in, at Equisat in Hyderabad. One thing I would like to share as a perspective uh, from, you know, module three, working with many centers so far is that the, a lot of times breeding programs, when they're trying to implement genomic selection, the large effect QTLs or traits often become a, 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 a tricky situation uh, to manage. Breeding programs often start with different parental materials when they want to implement GS. So we do not have a standard starting material. We're not comparing apples to apples, which really complicates the efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, breeding programs where they try to implement a mid-density solution to select. And it is often providing a, a, a confounding effect on the phenotypic data, especially when, you know, when, when it comes to stage one, we have a lot of breeding programs sometimes, they try to run, uh, you implement, uh, generate G-blobs, but then they have uh, some of the families carrying some really large effect QTLs and disease resistant, and some of them do not have them. And that really hampers the accuracy on, on phenotypic data. And of course, uh, have, having you know, different differences on, on those key traits would also have had implications on your effective population size. So um, a common strategy, which I thought was um, maybe many of you already know, and it's probably worth highlighting it again, is to come up with a common strategy to uh, tackle some of these uh, key traits on, on, in your breeding programs. Of course, every crop is a little different, but I do believe that you know, a lot of these ICR breeding programs, you do have some key traits, the must have traits that uh, we could potentially adopt this model that is taken up by the agri rice model on deploying traits uh, through trait augmentation. So the main difference between trait augmentation versus uh, the tra traditional MABC or market for breeding is that trait augmentation, we're really focusing on delivering key traits into parents or multiple parents in, in this case, so that the product of the product augmentation is, is a better starting materials or better programs for breeding, uh, for breeders to use. So it, it, it's often a separate pipeline that um, can be, you know, crank, we can be cranking out the, these lines very effectively through RGA setup. So again, the learning to date, many programs we support are often struggling with, um, you know, many of the key traits um, not present or easily accessible in elite background. And having each program convert their own materials to adding key traits is often not cost effective. And ideally, this is something that we should think about carrying it out in a very centralized manner and to support, uh, in, to develop a dedicated team to perform augmentation with the proper uh, setup and, and using the shared genotyping platform. And the operation is often crop agnostic, but we do have to give some considerations to, you know, inbred versus hybrid versus chrono crops, for example. But by and large, it's, it's not too different and it's an activity that can be easily centralized and it's very complementary to the GS strategy. And in the context of ICR breeding, I think in order to effectively utilize any mid-density platform, whether it's through EIB or whether it's in, you know, a solution that um, the group decides to build up in, in India, it is worth considering to partition a, a, a separate uh, trait deployment or augmentation pipeline to, to fix up all the must-have traits. Um, and that way we do not also sacrifice any precious advancement slots for, for some of these large effect traits or QTLs. 
And um, another point I would like to make is on, on the genomic resources. So a, a common bottleneck for uh, effective development of market resources could be QC panels for breeding strategies or genomic selection panel is really the lack of a centralized and, and well curated genomic uh, resource uh, or resources for various crops. Uh, without all the essential information being up to date and centrally stored is actually very challenging and time consuming for crop genomic scientists to design and optimize market strategy. And we've been struggling with this for the past two, three years, working with various CG centers and crop teams, including um, the teams in ICAR or in India. And the deficiency is, is actually more apparent in many of the smaller non-maize rice or wheat crops, which is not a surprise. And also many genomic information we have to date, they are often dated. They are generated with older genotyping technologies. And in addition, if the reference or whole genome data are available, sometimes they're also quite often biased towards diversity and land races, which really hampers the, the true utility in, in uh, the core breeding requirement. So, with that, in 2021, EIB had started this, this new initiative with the support of crops and hunger funding. We're planning to uh, reorganize all the available genomic resources for all the CG crops. We, we do plan to do this in collaboration with multiple uh, crop genomics leads and, and um, it will be a fully outsourced work. So in two, three months time, we should be able to have some, um, starting end of this year, we should have some really high quality new reference assemblies and resequencing data for, for the uh, core elite galaxy uh, for breeding programs that are available to the community for, for uh, market design or to implement uh, some of these trade strategies. In order to uh, better predict our parents, uh, we need to better understand our breeding diversity. And the more information we have on our parents, the more effective and efficient we are able to predict. And that would actually solve the, the, the long-standing questions that many breeding programs at this transition are asking. What is the right amount of markers um, to use to implement genomic selection? And, and the cost with genome, gen, genome assemblies and whole genome resequencing has really significantly reduced over time over the past few years. So often we also see that it's quite often that we are much better off starting with new data, especially, especially with some of these newer technologies, the long read technologies, rather than spending tremendous amount of effort in sifting through and imputing retrospective data sets. One example is that recently we had designed a, a sorghum um, a mid density panel with, you know, Icrosat. Uh, group as well as you know a few other collaborators um, from the USAID ILC project and some partners in um, in Africa. It took us almost eight nine months to almost a year to get that finalized. Part of the reason why it's so challenging to to come up with a a good enough density on on the mid on the mid density genomics selection panel is that we are trying to pull information from various different sources. We have information coming from you know, a chip-based platform. We have information coming from uh, GBS and all that. There's a lot of imputation work done. And then the, the community has also not agreed on a common set of um, elite parents or the diversity. So as we expand, as, we, as you want to not, as the group do not agree yet to somehow close off the breeding diversity, it becomes, an endless imputation work, trying to come up with the perfect panel. So that's always a conundrum that we are always facing when we design these panels. So we're trying to take some steps towards addressing this by um, generating some new fresh data to help um, uh, solve some of these bottlenecks uh, moving forward. And also it's worth pointing out that from our experience, for most crops that are routinely implementing genomic selection, typically we really do see a diminishing rate of return. Uh, if someone was saying that they need, you know, 10,000, 20,000 markers to effectively do GS, I, I think we need to go back to the drawing board to really look into uh, what is the diversity and what is your crossing strategy right now? Why, why do we need so much? Um, it, it, 
in, in, in general, for, for most public reading programs that are implementing this, in, in, I guess the most mature one would be the EV Rice Network. The, the typical GS panel, the density is around seven to 800. Anything more than that, it, it's really uh, not going to give you any more values. To date, many brain programs have started some form of genomic selection approaches to replace a conventional selection method. And there are also many large bilateral projects such as the AGG on, on wheat and maize, agri and rice, Avisa on dryland cereals and legumes, um, NextGen on, on cassava. They all have some built-in pretty significant components in establishing a network level uh, genomic selection strategy. And, and to enable a successful rollout of genomic selection, I, I think all these projects are realizing that to achieve genomic selection in a production scale, interdisciplinary support and proper utilization of tools and services when and where applicable is, is super, super essential. It's, it's not a matter of um, the breeding program deciding on the genome uh, GS pipeline. It, it really is a now cross-cutting exercise where um, all the expertise need to come together and co-develop this strategy uh, together. So for EIB supported breeding networks, we have a target date uh, by end of this year to roll out um, uh, for many of the crops to enable G block estimation with a mid density panel that, that we have. And, and um, Raja Guru will, will share some updates on that. Of course, this is done with the support from Eduardo's and, and the rest of the module two colleagues. It is rather an ambitious goal. And, and right now we, we are doing a lot of these um, um, housekeeping work to, with uh, many of breeding programs to do QAQC to clean up the gym plasms, make sure that you know the, the, the parents are, are, are pure in, in preparation for, for um, uh, the rollout on the network especially in, in many of NARS partners in Africa. So lastly, I just want to recap a, a common strategy, uh, a network approach is what module three is really striving for and we're really trying to support that. Choosing, often choosing the best GS model, which we get that question asked a lot, is really not the aim here. And to implement GS is a sustainable way it will require a long-term commitment on, on resources and it should be really becoming a part of breeding strategy. And we get a lot of questions that many breeding programs are asking us, um, you know, and they get often bogged down with this, like what is the optimal, um, um, I guess, um, approach that we should take? What is the optimal um, population size? What is the optimal market strategy? We often get bogged down with these. Uh, it's, it's been proven that GS will work under the right conditions, and a lot of it has, was already clearly explained by, by uh, Eduardo's uh, previous presentation. And GS, for us, what we, what our, our, um, our aim is that we, we're really trying to push the population need up. We want to use that to recycle our parents faster, and it's really not for vital release. If we can really agree on this and agree that we want to take steps towards confining our, our diversity space, I think we're going to be able to make um, huge impact and make some really uh, significant strides towards uh, implementing GS in, in, the, in, in our breeding programs. So I'm um, not sure if there's any questions, but um, I'm going to stop share and hand, it, hand this over to uh, Raja Guru for some updates on, on the tools and technologies we have. So thanks, Singh. So that was a really good introduction on the mid-density platform in the context of genomic selection. So I would like to update you on the mid-density genotyping service, which is available with the module three of excellence in breeding. So following the legacy of established genotyping shared services, which you all are very familiar with, the high throughput genotyping platform, which is currently rebranded as low density SNP genotyping services. So similar kind of system was established for the mid density genotyping, which is a low cost access to world class genotyping service for the CGR and partner breeding centers working on the majority of CGR mandate crops. So the EAB mid density genotyping service is typically a dot tag custom amplicon based genotyping method 
primarily suited for the application of genomic selection, but as well, you can also use this for diversity study, DNA fingerprinting, marker-rested background selection, coupled with the CASP-based targeted tri low density genotyping. So the service is targeted at CGR and our breeding institution, by which we aggregate the demand across the institution to offer a genotyping cost of the range between 10 to $11 per sample, depending on the number of sample you submit in a batch. And then we are also very keen on, you know, the turnaround time, which is a 10 to 15 working days once the sample reaches the lab. So this is the typical genotyping workflow, uh, irrelevant of either it's a low density or high density or the mid density one, which goes through the AB genotyping workflow. I hope the ICR team is already familiar with the workflow, with the experience from the utilizing the CAS-based marker platform through the low density genotyping service. So typically you fill in the form and then confirm the samples in the field, collect the samples and then complete the shipping formality. And then the sample reaches the vendor. The vendor confirm the samples and then form, and then they will go with the DNA extraction and uh, sequencing or genotyping and then prepare the results for implementation. Okay, so here comes the uh, main part on the update of the mid-density panel for different crop of interest. So before that, I would like to uh, give you a little background. So you may aware that many HD platform, high density platform, including the platform through NGS and then the array based platform. For instance, if you take rice, there are multiple array based platform like kernel 7K chip and then two type of 50K chip, 44K and then 700K, a lot of and lot of arrays are available. And then the main issue with those arrays and the platforms are really the cost. And also when you go for, you know, this kind of high density platform, you will also face challenges with the analytics. So considering all this, there is a very less effort has been made in developing informatic high throughput and cost effective genotyping solution specifically designed for applied breeding programs. So the HD platform is very much useful for, you know, the discovery work or, you know, the upstream research. But then here, the main point is how do we enable this kind of technology for the applied breeding program? So as you all know, the large scale application in crop breeding uh, across the globe for the population improvement strategy that integrate genomic selection, which requires routine genotyping, not a one-time job, which is require a routine genotyping of not just a few hundred lines, thousands of lines, depending upon you know, the breeding program size. And also the other important factor is the shorter turnaround time, which is possible to make in uh, the correct decisions within the season for the uh, estimation of genomic estimated breeding values. And then the other important factor is, you know, the global breeding program require the breeding population to be tested in multiple location with different planting dates, leaving a very small window to sample process and analyze genotypic data. The current complexity of the high density technology and the cost, and then especially the analytics are really limiting this kind of methodology for the real breeding program. Keeping in this mind, we try to develop the mid density panel through the DART platform, which is a custom amplicon based sequencing technology with limited cost. So here you can see, you know, the main crop of interest for ICR, which is, you know, in the first part, the eight crops, and then what are the, you know, the market density and which stage these were. So I primarily uh, dissected this uh, status into four paces, whether it is in discussion with the different crop breeding network, as Singh mentioned, this is not really easy. So we are not just uh, developing this platform for one breeding program on one region. We are developing especially for the inclusivity of all the crop breeding networks especially the national program in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So this involves a lot of discussion back and forth with the CG breeding group and then market development group with the different crop breeding network. So most of the crops that has been passed on through this planning phase. And then once we have these markers uh, with us and then we will uh, submit those markers for in silico analysis and then which will, which will 
give you you know the uh, designed marker which pass on the uh, pipeline developed by dart and then it will comes for the uh, ordering of those assay and then those markers will be utilized for uh, validation of initial either 384 set which comes from a single or multiple region once you have all those validated data that will be really implemented in a routine basis so rice potato wheat are the three crops which passed on all those uh, phases and which is currently being in implementation phase so i'll be presenting on you know the uh, status of all these three crops for uh, in the later part of the slide so if you see rice potato and wheat which were in the implementation phase and then there is also development of panel for maize sorghum and pgnp which is through the aav platform so there are also the other platform which uh, are available externally especially you know this pearl millet which icr team is involved uh, in developing the 2k array and then there is also 5k array for chickpea which is available with ecrisat i would also like to um, include some of the other crops which are not primarily targeted through this icr bmg project but may be of interest for you externally you can freely uh, interact with us to utilize this marker panel for cowpea groundnut and there are also the, the two other uh, crops finger millet and cassava which is under uh, discussion so i would like to give you a little bit of background on three different crops which are uh, which are in the implementation phase so i would like to acknowledge uh, susan from simit damian from iri hanale from sip for providing these slides in a very timely manner so first i would like to go with the mid density genotyping service so i already uh, explained you you know what is the platform so why i included all this slide is to just give you a little bit of background what kind of methodology went in the background to come up with the you know very precise number of markers for instance if you see the uh, peat mid density panel which is version 1 which currently have like 2400 plus markers so if you see this marker this includes the gene and qtl related sequence and then the markers for the utilized for the qc purpose which is a quality control method and then which is highly polymorphic uh, across the smith germplasm and also there is a huge collection of genome wide distributed snps and then apart from this kind of genomic and trait based marker the group also tried to capture important marker data which is available with other platform for instance in we they try to capture you know almost like 480 markers from the ksu exome sequence capture platform and then they try to uh, compare this uh, data which has been generated for a set of 384 lines and then compared with the marker data set with the high density gbs method and then also for relevance they also come up with a limited number of markers for gbs maybe i'll just show you with my pointer on okay so if you see over here this is a huge data gbs collection and then for the uh, you know meaningful comparison they are also taken the subset of marker which generated from gbs and then compared with the genotyping data generated with the dart tag platform interestingly if you see over here they have compared the uh, prediction accuracy for uh, different uh, important traits like grain yield stem rust and so on and then if you see if it is a green color which means the prediction accuracy for that particular marker platform is very high uh, interestingly if you see over here for most of the traits whether it is you know uh, in the medium range when compared to the gbs method or which is of high prediction accuracy for instance if it is grain yield and then also there is no much difference between you know different methodologies meaning the markers data set which has been generated through the dart platform which is very robust and also very comparable with the high number of markers with the high density platform so this kind of information you can also go through the toolbox available with the excellence in breeding so here is the link we also constantly keep updating this information so that the user can go through whenever they require 
So that's the version one. It's not you know a closed activity. It's a continuous process with the lessons learned from the validation and then implementation. The group also constantly improve those panel. For instance, there is a process ongoing for the version two development with uh, targeting 3,900 markers, pulling out the important and then meaningful marker from the version one, and also include more number of gene and QTL related markers. And then uh, topping up with the additional QC marker, which has been developed through the uh, low density platform and high number of uh, genome-wide distributed marker. You can see over here, you know, the distribution of this marker across the uh, chromosome of bread wheat. You can see, you know, a widely distributed marker set. And then apart from the genomic marker, they are also similar to version one, try to pull out more number of markers from exome sequence capture. And currently they were also adding more number of markers developed from the axiom breeder chip. So coming to the rice, which is uh, very well utilized and then available with the different platform. For instance, you can avail this latest version to AgriPlex as well, and then same is available with the DART. So this is also an interesting case, you know, where you can see the robustness of uh, work which went in a background for developing all this market. So let me just give you some kind of data. The SNPs were selected from two publicly available resources. One is the Cardinal 6K, and then as you all know, RISE has a very good resequencing uh, lines. And then if you see the 3000 right genome, those data were included. And then the high call rates were uh, considered with the high minor relate frequency, which were developed from the uh, 1000 plus uh, indical lines, which were genotyped with the 6K array. The remaining markers were pulled out from the 3000 right genome, similar to the high call rate and high minor allele frequency. So if you see uh, the average of uh, minor, minor allele frequencies greater than 0.3 uh, for all these markers selected. This is not only the case, there is also an importance here with the polymorphic SNPs, which you can expect between any two indica, indica cross or Indica Japonica cross in the range of 400 to 450 markers uh, when you use this panel for your uh, cross breeding validations. And then uh, this is going to be my last slide. So just to give you a brief on the update of potato mid density genotyping service. So similar to uh, what went ahead with the wheat and then rice, you can also uh, see the similar kind of work when behind developing this 2.1K panel. So there was like a 2,100 plus marker with the density of uh, two to three SNPs per centimorgan across all 12 potato chromosomes, primarily used for uh, genomic selection and diversity studies. So in the similar way, what I explained for you, the other crops. So these were also developed from uh, a robust data. The markers are a subset from a potato version three infinium array, which combined the SNPs developed from different projects like uh, Solnish Solicap project, so in addition, there are also important traits for PVV resistant marker also included. In the same way, the minor relief frequency were the primary uh, key attribute for selecting this marker, which is 0.1 centimal, 0.1 uh, in case of uh, potato material from SIP on North American germplasm. They also try to uh, you know, come up with the dose response winners based on the data coming from the dark tick uh, ratio. So these were some of the key update coming to the uh, panel available with the mid-density genotyping service with the AV. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. So I will take this opportunity to thank uh, the different uh, key crop breeding network, the CG scientist, the national partner, and especially the funding agency, which provides you know, as for developing all this market. So I would like to uh, convey my gratitude to all these partners and the uh, funding agency. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr.